So my name is Michael Keane. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I am the co-founder and head roaster of Rivers and Roads Coffee. I'm also an artist and illustrator and designer, and I think that makes me happy to have you all around me. I firmly believe in the power of art and creativity to change the world. And it thrills me to speak to an audience who does that every day. And so thank you for coming out. I also want to thank Creative Mornings and our sponsors, volunteers, organizers. Uh, they make this pretty amazing thing happen every month, and I think that's uh, something to be applauded. So thank you, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> Which direction? <laughs> I like how we burn it down. That's, that's nice. <laughs> Before we begin, I want to do something that's maybe a little risky considering how early it is, but we also had coffee and burritos, so I think we should be fine. But I want everyone to close your eyes and picture for a moment a time in your life that had a profound impact on you. And when we talk about this concept of moments that all of us are speaking on around the world, I think we all know that there's a power to this. So close your eyes and think about what that would have been. For some of you, this would be a moment when you met your partner or the moment you lost a loved one. A near-death experience or maybe a near-life experience. Maybe it was the moment something shifted in your worldview and your perspective snapped into a new position. Whatever your moment, pull it inside and remember. Feel how it felt, smell how it smelled, and taste what it tasted, what you tasted. Hold this moment in your mind. Don't worry what anyone around you is doing or thinking. Just return yourself to that time and feel it. I know you can do this because all of the big moments in our lives get burned into our souls. We get to return to them again and again for reminder and reexamination. Thinking of this, word, this moment, choose a word that it would have represented. Don't be clever or worry about what others will say or think. You know the right word. As complex as these moments tend to be, as nuanced, as impactful at their core, they're often pretty simple. Open your eyes. What was your moment? <laughs> Deferred responsibility right next to you. What, what would be your moment? What's the word? Catalyst. What was your word? Freedom. Freedom. Back here in the middle in leather, what was your word? Travel. Travel. These are powerful words. These are triggers for even more powerful ideas and actions, negative and positive. The way we react to them defines our entire story. What I think is so fascinating is that the same word given to different people will have a different reaction. It's the nature of these experiences that often our subconscious has been laying the groundwork for months, even years, responding to subtle cues from the universe until suddenly everything aligns and clicks into place, the experience is realized and we have this thing. It tends to require that an almost incomprehensible list of occurrences conspire together to enable these experiences, each is necessary in a unique way, each is fragile beyond belief but together carrying the momentum of inevitability. I would imagine that for many of you, the moment you selected was actually not that big a deal when it occurred. Sometimes it takes distance and thought and actions for us to realize that a moment was actually an enormous turning point within our lives. Intuitively, we all understand the power of these turning points for good and bad, for change or stagnation, for growth or regression. Every moment of our life is filled with infinite opportunity for something. Now what that something becomes is really up to us. Individually, these somethings are just things that occurred, but taken collectively, acted upon, and viewed with a little distance, it becomes clear that our lives, though messy, are a beautiful tapestry, woven from an elaborate series of interconnected yet separate moments containing our entire existence. Within this fabric is hidden a pattern of startling beauty, which can guide us towards a life of love, creativity, and connection, but only if we listen. We're given this infinite series of little tiny cues that are guiding us along the path of our intuition, but if we don't listen, it's without value. 
My talk today is really about how I learned to listen to these cues, these moments of intuition, and the profound impact this has had on my life. So, first I want to tell you a little about me and my career and how we got here. Um, like many of you, as a creative, uh, my career has had a lot of starts and stops. I'm classically educated as a fine artist. I went to school to learn how to paint. I'm a surrealist. But there was something missing in this. I love the practice of being in a studio, but for me, and this isn't for everyone, I was missing some element. I think for me it was almost too personal. It was too mm, self-indulgent in a sense. Not that that's true of many artists. This drew me towards the world of creation uh, through teamwork, illustration, working along with teams for animation and design. Um, as most of you know, there's an undeniable power in collaboration. We all thrive on working with other creative minds to find novel solutions. Uh, I think for a lot of us, being in a team amplifies our skills well above and beyond what we would have arrived to on our own. In a parallel to my career in the arts, I've always worked in the restaurant and service industry. First just to pay for bills while I was educating myself, but then it became something more. I started at the age of 14 as a busboy in a fine dining German restaurant, which um, was an interesting thing. Both of the owners had fled World War II, uh, the sort of ravages of World War II, ended up in America, and had very, very serious concepts of what service meant. So I learned under an old school European fine dining regime, and it was, um, I mean, literally they would like whip their, their people if they made mistakes. It's not okay to do that anymore. Um, <laughs> I've been involved since. There's something about this industry that got under my skin, and I wouldn't have guessed that. I didn't give it the credit that it deserved early on. I thought of it as something to feed myself with, and I never realized that it was actually feeding me in a real way. Over the last 22 years when I've been involved with food, I've actually held every position in a, in a restaurant. I mean, literally every position. Uh, I've even hosted two online cooking shows, and eventually I became an executive chef, owned and operated my own coffee house. And the interesting thing about these two parallel careers in art and food is that they begin to overlap. Uh, little things that I had learned in one field would overlap into the other and save my bacon there. Uh, the business and accounting skills that I learned uh, running a restaurant allowed me to build a strong and stable design and illustration studio. Uh, on the same sort of Inverse side of that, the problem-solving skills that I learned as an illustrator and designer would often allow me novel solutions within the restaurant and design world, or in, in service world. Uh, both careers still allowed for the constant use of my creative talents. Both careers were filled with moments of critical decision-making. Uh, simple acts on either side could drive me forward or bring me low. Sorry, I'm not good at memorization, so I have a lot of papers. I remember the moment that I decided to open my own restaurant, actually really vividly. This was a big moment for me. I was in San Juan, Puerto Rico, vacationing with friends. And we were having dinner at this wonderful little restaurant. I found an image of it on the side here. It's called La Ostracosa. If you're ever in old San Juan, go. It was amazing. Uh, this restaurant is phenomenal. It's owned by this wonderful, gay, New York, uh, Puerto Rican man who just poured every ounce of his passion into this little space, and the food and the service and the experience showed it. This guy is living his why, and it was so apparent in every taste, every aspect of the, the space. Uh, along the wall in front of us was this wonderful old brick wall covered in vines with parrots in it, and there was a hole from a cannon uh, that is from the 14th century, and I later found out that this was originally the, the residence of the Spanish viceroy in the 14th century, so this is one of the oldest buildings in this hemisphere, and we're eating and drinking coffee in it. And we had one of those nights, you've all had them, where just everything was perfect. You could tell that the food was cooked with love. You could tell that an entire wonderful series of events had conspired to bring us this thing. And we've all had it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For me, I realized within that moment that this is exactly what I want to bring to the world. That was the moment uh, that I would call, my word for that was inspiration. And I would say that that moment is rippled through my years in a pretty profound way. A year and a great deal of effort later, with the help of many wonderful people, I opened my first cafe, which was called Studio Six Coffee House. We were located in the heart of the art district on Santa Fe Drive, surrounded by artists, studios, and galleries, hidden within a courtyard. It was beautiful with plants and artwork. 
And it was exactly what I wanted it to be. I, I would hear all the time through comments on Yelp or whatever it was that people said, hey, I just found this place and it, it gave me the sense that I was on vacation and I thought, eh, that's pretty good. That's what we set out to do. Uh, the feeling of the space was exactly what we were hoping to do and I would stop within these random moments and just realize that we had hit on something that was magical. And during that time, I was really overworked, I was really underpaid, but I was also really happy. And as time passed and my staff and I began to push the, the envelope, we began to, to chase this elusive challenge that is latte art. And the goal there is to make every single drink something special. It shows your customer that you had the skills to execute this, that you cared about their order enough to do it for them. And you have to remember, at the time, this was still in its infancy. You couldn't walk into every shop and even your chai now had a rosetta on it. Uh, there was a sense of friendly competition uh, amongst all of the shops. I remember Aviano, which had just opened on Lincoln, uh, they were killing it. Like they were going to national level uh, competitions for baristas and there was kind of this friendly rivalry where we're like, oh man, they're really good, we've got to get better. And so all of us started uh, really pushing it. And the thing with my staff being in the art district is they all were artists and I was an artist. And that's when I realized that there was another overlap from my two worlds possible. My abilities to draw and paint actually really applied to the, the practice of making latte art because here I had a medium, I had espresso crema, and I had textured milk, and then I had a stylus, and I could draw and paint. And this all seems really obvious now, but people weren't doing it yet. So like any idea in retrospect, it's like, well, yeah, of course, but we were apparently the, the instigators of this. And so it happened on this day that a regular customer, uh, customer whose name is Mark, I don't know if he's here. Are you here, Mark? He's a marketing guy, so I wouldn't have been too surprised. But he comes into the studio, and he had a little time, I had time, and I decided to put his portrait on the top of the latte. Um, this was not done yet, so <laughs> it didn't turn out great, but it turned out okay. And he snapped a picture of it, and he put it on his social media. And this was my first experience with this concept of going viral. Uh, within a really disturbingly short window of time, this thing had been shared millions of times, and it's suddenly just like this thing. And we're still, you know, just making coffee and working. Uh, I come to work the next day, and I've got this list of phone calls from, you know, news outlets and media outlets. And long story short, um, I suddenly blink, and in a whirlwind, uh, my wife and I, well, now wife, are in New York, and I'm appearing on the Today Show. And we're standing under these horrendously hot studio lights and I'm like trying not to sweat and like to not be, you know, not to go to the bathroom in my pants and <laughs> <laughs> it's a really, really intimidating process. And then I had asked for an espresso machine and they gave me like a really nice home one and so I'm like, ah, I don't know how to do this. Um, but it was cool. So we got through this moment and I was able to share coffee with an audience of eight million people. And that spread our story in a really cool way um, my word for that time is stress. <laughs> and stress is interesting. I've always thought about this word. Uh, I heard a cool definition of it where it's basically the difference between your body's capability for dealing with change and then the change that's asked of it. That was a time where I was asked for a lot of change really rapidly. I'd gone from this kind of idyllic little microcosm of my coffee shop to suddenly having to exist within this greater realm and to be aware of a media presence. I was a guy who shaved, like, not a lot. And um, I wore shorts every day. I didn't have uh, clothes that could go on television because that didn't matter to me. Uh, and so everything was escalating. Uh, and from there, I started to share coffee with people from all over the world. Uh, I got to be on television a lot in a bunch of magazines and newspapers and radio shows. Uh, even had a national restaurant chain make a commercial making fun of me. And um, <laughs> it was a fun process. They actually, they contacted me and said, hey, we'd like to make fun of you in our commercial. Could you come out and help us? And so <laughs> I uh, got to do that. Um, it was an interesting time, but what it really taught me was this kind of painful lesson about focus and then also holding on to what makes you happy. I hadn't opened this cafe because in my mind I said I want to do TV. That's a really roundabout path. I'd opened this cafe because I wanted to connect with people in a genuine way and I wanted to connect to that energy that sort of said, hey, I'm here and I'm connected to something more powerful, something bigger than me. Within all of this, I allowed myself to get pretty caught up in concepts of success that looked good from the outside but didn't actually satisfy my intuition and were ultimately miles away from what had inspired me to open in the first place. I allowed the glamour of possibility to distract my focus from what had drawn me to this dream. 
the energy that used to allow me to connect with tons of regular customers and tourists in a really genuine and intimate manner was suddenly shifted into these ultimately very trivial concerns. My interactions became kind of shallow and businesslike, and the line of people waiting for your attention and all expecting this kind of experience of, oh, hey, and they want to share the same story of where they were and when they saw you on TV and how they sent their aunt this thing and they're really happy and they came to, to Denver for this, uh, got really repetitive and weird. And even though it started out fun, I started to hate it. And um, not because people weren't genuine, but because it just started to feel like I was a character actor in my own life. Um, the energy also shifted, so I suddenly felt as if this thing that used to wake me up with a smile, I got up early because I owned a coffee shop, but I got up ready and excited for the day and who I was going to see and the, the challenge of how to do my best every day. That shifted, and so I woke up with this heavy weight of obligation. I, woke, I was kind of bummed out to get out of bed in the mornings, and that's not a good sign ever. If you find yourself not liking getting out of bed, look closely at what's going on because something is, is up. Um, our body is not subtle in its cues on that level. I also learned that our ideal path is often hidden by kind of shiny distractions. We have to listen to, learn to our intention carefully. We have to learn to discern our correct actions. And seemingly good things can sometimes pull us away from our dreams. My word for that time was decision, because I remember this moment when it hit me. It wasn't a big thing, but it was a big thing. I was sitting on the couch and I was reading and suddenly I noticed that I had made a decision. It just happened that I was aware that somewhere within the last 20 seconds I had decided that I couldn't continue on this path. That's weird. It's strange to suddenly be informed of your own thoughts, um, but <laughs> it was important. <laughs> so my then fiance and now wife and I sold the coffee shop. This was a big deal. I was severing myself from what might be called the largest aspect of my outward identity. I was choosing to start over. I was terrifying uh, on many ways. It seemed crazy. I was walking away from a lot, but I just knew. I had this intuitive, fundamental belief that I had to shift something. So I found the right buyers, and I sold my coffee shop. And uh, I knew that I needed people who would care for my community the way that I did. And we found some great people, and they, they're living their dream right now there. My word for that time is release. It was a shift. It was one second, and then the next. Everything was different. I went from having a place I had to be every day to suddenly I could do anything. I had some money in my pocket. I had time. I had, you know, the things we're supposed to really want. Following this, ended up in this interesting time of exploration. There's a ton of paths available to us. I mean, there was talk of a book deal. Uh, we actually shot an entire uh, photo book, a coffee table book of my latte art that threw a kind of different story, but a funny thing, it just never happened. Um, all the money was spent, all the deals were made, and then it just stalled out because these things do that. Um, same thing, we had a travel TV show centered around coffee, the idea being kind of like man versus food, but coffee. Um, we talked about diving deeper into consultancy and barista training, but in the end, something kept leading us away. Um, I've noticed this phenomenon many times. When you're on the right path, it sort of seems like everything lines up and things become easy. You have conflict, but it's solvable conflict. When you're on the wrong path, it's almost like the universe is saying like, hey dummy, pay attention, and it keeps throwing up roadblocks. Well, that, cap that happened. I had like a kind of big chunk of time where I hit a lot of fundamentally um, giant roadblocks. Partnerships that dissolved when they shouldn't have. Things that were going really great, but then would suddenly run out of money. It's a very interesting time for us. But I did realize is you have to pay attention. So for a time I drifted. Uh, I started, um, I was involved with a talk show called The Untitled Art Show. I helped start some other companies. Uh, One Wall was a public art project. I did a ton of consulting. I even took some career level positions thinking like, okay, what's the next thing? I, I was the chef at Sir Le Tab, uh, program director at Museum of Outdoor Arts, uh, the, the host of Powered by Art, another talk show about art. Um, then finally program director at Art Gym Denver. All of these things were amazing. Uh, I kept thinking I was ungrateful or something was wrong with me because here I was with someone else's dream job, but I wasn't happy. And I think that at the end, Nothing was resonating with my intuitive belief that there was something out there. At the same time, I was also not paying very close attention to these kind of profound signals that were coming to me. I look, at back, uh, I look back at that time and I can really see them now. I'm like, oh, that happened. If I'd been paying attention, I could have done this. 
But that's the thing with these experiences is they, they repeat, but they also get quieter. And if you're not paying attention, then I think the challenge becomes more profound of how do I tie into this intuition? I mean, in high school, we all had to read The Alchemist, right? And that was one of these great books about how your, your life legend is whispering to you, but it gets quieter the longer you ignore it. And I think that was a really big lesson for us. Um, during that time frame, though, things were really good. I wasn't, like, unhappy exactly. I mean, I got married to the love of my life. Uh, we got to travel a bunch. Uh, that's us eating dim sum, which is my favorite thing. Um, and so this is my wife and I, and what we both kind of agree was one of the happiest days of our life. So within this kind of eh, time, we actually had a really amazing experience. This was us on the North Shore of, of Oahu uh, running in the, the rainforest in this crazy rainstorm where no one else was out because they were afraid of the rain, and we instead had this like giant botanical garden to ourselves. It was amazing. Um, but then Des got sick, and suddenly everything was about this battle against Lyme disease. And she'd been sick for a long time. We just didn't know what with. Uh, she was living, but something was really wrong. And I won't spend a lot of time on this, but suffice it to say, Lyme disease is it's a brutal, misunderstood disease. And it's ruined countless lives, and it's taken all of our resources to combat, emotional, physical, financial. Uh, it's one of these things that we just didn't see coming. And then suddenly we went from my powerful crossfitting wife who could run marathons and do anything to, to my, my wife who was in the fight for her life. And I remember sitting with her one night in the emergency room thinking that this was the end. Her heart had begun stopping at random increments and we were terrified. The doctors didn't know what to do. Uh, it's such an un research disease. They don't know a lot about it. And there's this belief that it's not real, so the research is, is stopped in a very strange way. But um, nothing about this was not real for us. And I remember looking at her, and she was broken and frail, and I couldn't see any hope of a future for us. The moment we were in seemed like this impenetrable barrier that was cloaking everything else, any possibility of light or joy. And I was convinced I was losing my best friend. My word for that moment would be fear. I won't make you relive the roller coaster that was our lives, but if you fast forward almost three years to now, and Desiree is approaching remission uh, through her unbelievable tenacity and a, set, a steadfast insistence on following her intuition about her treatment path, we're finally able to see a light at the end of the tunnel. We're beginning to breathe again, and I can look back at the last years and all of the fight we went through, and suddenly I can see them as actually a necessary reset. Uh, they were a moment in our lives that was terrible but kind of had to happen. And the thing about battling illness is that it leaves absolutely no room for the frivolous. Uh, it shaves your actions and thoughts into a streamlined tool for battle and forcefully realigns your worldview whether you wanted it to or not. Looking again at our lives with renewed hope for a real future, we finally had to confront the reality that we hadn't really been living we had mistaken survival for life, and our grand excuse of sickness, which was now passing, was allowing us to slowly die inside as Des also slowly grew stronger. And even before she was in treatment and our fight had begun in earnest, we'd been living our lives as if we had all the time in the world. It's not true. We don't. We lacked the urgency to truly live that I think makes a brilliant life possible. So for too long, we allowed ourselves to frantically chase every path to look for ways to satisfy this belief we had that there was something amazing out there, but all the while ignoring the very intuition that could have guided us to that thing, allowing ourselves to say, we'll find happiness when this is all over. So we continued to bide our time, saying to ourselves, you know, let's get through this. Let's just get through this. That became a mantra for us, survive, survive. But then there was another moment for me. It was on an afternoon I was driving to the Central Park Rec Center, I know, um, over in Stapleton to work out. And I listened to a voicemail from my mom. Don't worry, I was on speakerphone. And she left this message that you shouldn't leave this kind of information in a message, but she was trying to call the whole family and figure it out. And it turns out that my dad had inoperable pancreatic cancer. And you'd think, like, we'd been through a lot with medicine. You'd think I would be inured to this, that I'm ready. I could get this kind of thing. But apparently for all of us, we hit a breaking point. And for me, that was it. The extra straw on my back broke it. And I just remember 
all of my thoughts flying back through my time of childhood. My mom had breast cancer. Uh, she met my stepdad, Rich, who was this amazing guy, while she was on chemotherapy. They got married during that time frame. Their love story to me is an absolute inspiration. It wasn't about physical attraction. It was about real partnership. And they're so in love, and it's, it's magical to see. It just seemed completely unfair that they were having to deal with cancer again after all this time. And all of this is flooding through my mind. The moment gathers around me, and it's just like, you know when the, it's almost like that wah-wah feeling, everything shrinks in, and I had to pull over and just breathe. I couldn't even cope with the thought of driving. And within this pregnant space, something shifted inside of me. And this sudden clarity, this realignment, emerged from the cloud of possibility that had been crippling me over the past few years. My intuition suddenly showed me the first glimpse of a new dream, and ideas just began to rage through my head. I saw a new path laced with the potent knowledge that this life is short, and that happiness is a choice, and we can't defer it. If we wait until we're well or till everything is easy, nothing happens. I knew with complete clarity that I had to leap and that that leap had to happen right now. In my mind, a hundred subconscious desires and plans had coalesced instantly and I began to see this dream clearly for the first time. And interestingly, it was a return to coffee. Who would have thought? I could picture suddenly a cafe built on pillars of community and love and I could see the added support of partnership with my wife. I had always done the last shop by myself. The difference of doing this with a partner who gets you is pretty cool. You should try it. Um, I got home that night and I told Des what I'd been thinking. And we shared a pretty good cry because it, it was a big day. But then we also kind of just like straightened up and we had a challenge in a direction for the first time in a long time. My word for that time was decision again. It's interesting how the two decisions bracket each other, and the one I was letting go and the other I was picking something up. Uh, this one felt better. So that brings us to this moment. In this moment, I've resigned my job. I'm no longer the program director at Art Gym. We've sold our home, and we're risking everything to open another coffee shop. This time we're taking into account all of the lessons from the last years, but we're modeling it on a new vision of community and love that sprang into our minds that rainy day filled with terrible news. It's hard to do all these. Over the last months, my wife, and I'm now proud to say business partner and I, have talked at length about how to build again. What's more sustainable? How do we reconnect with that thing that made us fall in love with coffee in the first place? We're lucky to align in our lives. Why? We both believe in the big truth that love is the most powerful force in the universe, and people are at their most noble when we rise together. We know that we are not so much opening a business as helping to build a community-based love-based uh, project that is all about love, trust, and conceived as a bulwark against the rising tide of hate and fear in our world. We ask ourselves every single day, in every decision, every element of design, are we placing love above all else? This has become our mantra at every turn. One glance at the news proves why we have to do this. In this time of great separation and struggle, when hope is strained and people feel alienated from family, from neighbors, from their community, we want to make a haven and a source of healing for our community, a place where people from different walks of life, belief, and backgrounds can share a meal and connect. So then how do we build community? We knew to start that we had to start by planting seeds. We can't just clap our hands and say, let there be community, and suddenly everyone's holding hands and singing kumbaya. It doesn't work like that. There's too much anchorage, I think, at this point. But we did have a, an inspiration available to us. This guy is awesome. Uh, if you don't know him, this is Bruce Randolph, Daddy Bruce. This guy's a total hero of mine. Um, he's this guy whose colorful past and passion for life inspired him to build this incredible program of feeding people. He believed that food could heal, and he believed that unity was more important than separation. And in a time that was actually a lot rougher in many ways than what we're going through now, when our city had a lot more racial tension and when our country was in, in not a great place, he was able to use food to inspire our city to embrace equality and brotherhood. And even though he's passed away, his efforts are continued by the Epworth Foundation, and he still feeds thousands of families every holiday season. And I think that's a really cool thing. 
And so we looked at that and said, you know, that actually connects to a tradition from the restaurant world, which is a thing called family dinner. Family dinner is this moment of calm right before the shift starts, and it's when the whole staff, front of the house, back of the house, uh, which if you've never worked in restaurants is actually a pretty big dividing line a lot of times, uh, we all sit down together and share a meal. And it's this really cool thing because it allows us to repair the anger from last night's shift when chef yelled at you. And it allows you to reconnect to why the hostess did what she did. And oh yeah, she's a person. And uh, everybody comes together. It's a pretty powerful time. And the restaurants that don't do it, I think, lose something pretty, pretty cool. So we looked at that and we said, hey, wait, here's a tradition from our community or from our world that we can bring to this as well. And so we decided that on the second Sunday of every month, we're going to host a, a dinner that's on a donation basis. We'll cook up a family dinner, and people, every, you guys are welcome. Please join us. Uh, you can come, and you can pay nothing if you don't have any money, or you can donate some money if you've got it. And our goal is that this will help to fund community projects, because it helps to put your attention into your community in a real way, not just words. But more importantly, we want you to come and actually talk to people and meet folks that you would never sit down at one table with. And we know it's just a seed, but we have this idea that this could actually spring up. Like, what would happen if a bunch of the restaurants in the area started doing this? What if people opened their homes up, too? And we started doing family dinners where strangers, instead of thinking, oh, that's the, uh, the folks across the way that it smells weird when they cook, what if instead you were able to, to sit with them and get to know them as people? And uh, we think that would be pretty awesome. And as an expression of love, food is, is the best. So... That's what we're battling for, is love above hate, and food is our chosen weapon. We're under construction right now, Rivers and Roads Coffee. We named it after a song we loved, and it's a process. <laughs> construction is ongoing, and we'll open in uh, early spring. We're not giving an exact date yet, just because life has been exciting on that front. But 2539 Bruce Randolph Avenue, we'd love for you to come by. It's north of City Park, and hope you'll join us for a cup of coffee and some conversation. And on one final update, I'm happy to share that Des is doing really well. Hi, Des. <laughs> and after a kind of crazy round of 12 chemotherapies that involved five different treatments coming together, my father is currently cancer-free. If you don't know this, Anschutz is one of the best cancer clinics in the world, and we have them here in our backyard, and those folks are working with him to make a plan to fight a risk of recurrence. But my word for this moment is hope. Thank you so much.